I'm Tommy Curran. How are we doing this week? Tremendous. What's going on with you? Well, I know that you're uh, you're feeling pretty good because you were the best non NBA player at the uh, the shot for a cure the other day. Correct? That's how I've heard it worded. Well, that's only because Arkan couldn't get in. He he was tardy. That's right. I wasn't. It, I didn't know about he it. Was, I didn't know I could even late. shoot. He was late. It was rough. The day of. It, he got a pity invite late, and then Arkan blew it off. It well, was uh, probably all we should talk about that. It event. was a sad state of affairs. I know Mego doesn't want to dwell on this, but I understand why you're uh, you're feeling very good, Tom. I want to ask you about something we asked about a few weeks ago at the Super Bowl: the lack of buzz and how the Patriots are fifteenth out of thirty, or however you put it, below the Chicago Bears when it comes to buzz at the Super Bowl. How much do you think that's starting to bother ownership? Because I don't, I don't see a way to get super buzzy this offseason. Free agency stinks. If you're not doing anything at quarterback, I, I don't really understand how you get the buzz. How much does that bother Robert Kraft? I think it has to be somewhat significant in that, look, if you're going to improve your facilities and take upon yourself the ability to continue to have this team be at the vanguard of the sport, you have to generate local interest. You have to generate local sponsorships. You have to sell. And the Patriots are still in that boat. I mean, we can watch games from December and see the number of empty seats at Gillette Stadium, the lack of noise and buzz in the stadium. So, yeah, it it has to be absolutely. And if it wasn't something that the Patriots had at the forefront of their minds, would they have sent out a season ticket holder email that was as, really strongly worded as this one that we just saw a month ago was. I would say no, two months ago. So, But I still think you're right. The only way to create it, though, is put the elements in place and win games. And I think that they've taken the biggest stride they possibly can in doing that. Tom, looking at the quarterback contracts that were signed earlier this week, What's the direct implication for Mac Jones's future? And uh, what do you see? How do you see the Patriots playing that out as compared to some of these contracts? You know, there's a little bit of a range at the beginning of the week. It started to create a middle class. You know, the Geno Smith deal, the Derek Carr deal, when you scrutinize that, the Daniel Jones deal, they're all in the low 30s. I mean, as the salary cap and the money coming in from television continues to go up. The salary cap's going to go up. But previously, you're looking at everybody from Kyler Murray, who is an unaccomplished player who was the first overall pick, to Deshaun Watson, um, to Josh Allen. Everyone's 43 to 46 with almost $200 million guaranteed was going to become in vogue. The fact that you got four and 150 for Daniel Jones and his tepid production so far in his career, you could at least look at it and say, well, at least somebody slots in a reasonable spot that isn't really $40 million a year. So that, to me, I don't know if that's encouraging for the Patriots to think about going from $4 million to upwards of $35 million for Mac Jones, but that's going to be the going rate. Tommy, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, you told Gresham Fourier that the Patriots, if they had to have a motto for their offseason, it would be that they pretty much have what they need and that they're not going to make any big sort of splashes. Is that still the case, do you think? Is that still something you would uh, you would report if you if you were asked? I just – what Jones said at the start is apt. What can you do? I mean, you have – Devontae Parker and Kendrick Bourne both making pretty decent money wide receiver. Well, that's not really yeah. the question, like, what can you do? It's like, is that what they feel about their own roster, I guess, is more my question. I would presume so. I mean, you've pay- what I'm getting at is you've already paid a crap ton of guys. So you like these players. If you agree that they were held back by the coaching decisions and the way you managed 2022, you say, okay, well, We'll run it back with these guys that are coaching offense. They have to feel pretty good about their defensive output last year. So to me, I just don't see it in terms of where's the yawning need on the team that makes them go, we have to go bananas in free agency. I mean, I, I personally would hope wide receiver, but I don't know that they feel that way. I don't think so either. I mean, they've always been, what is that thing that they used to say on the other radio station? Would you rather fight? 50 tiny ducks or one giant one? Yes, 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 exactly. That yeah. was a wiggy thing. I they think. want the 50 tiny ducks. Yeah. yeah, they like the 50 tiny ducks. 
which I do, you know, I, I feel 50, 50 tiny ducks would be difficult to agree with. I can't really argue with that logic. He's Tommy Curran, okay. NBC Sports boss. And I'm sorry, Tom, keep going. That's okay. Somebody's going to peck you when you get 50. <laughs> um, Tom, I want to play you a, a, a clip. This is from Chris Curtis on the Greg Hill Show this morning. And I want your reaction to, uh, to, to this report on Bill O'Brien and the, the time frame of his hiring. According to the people I've spoken to in Indianapolis, Bill Belichick hired Bill O'Brien as early as November and as late as December in the second half of this Patriots season. Wow. He was hired before the season concluded to replace Patricia as the offensive coordinator for the New England Patriots. Okay, so I, I like hired maybe is, feels a, a touch strong, but like could there have been some sort of wink and nod backroom agreement between the two Bills in season last year? Because that to me personally, and I don't know anything, that to me sounds plausible. Pl- uh, doesn't sound plausible to me in that you're talking not about some guy who's the offensive coordinator at Slippery Rock. You're talking about somebody who's involved with Saban. And Saban and Belichick have compared notes via NFL films about rating staffs. So I would imagine that as the season's going on, Belichick's not going to be rigging up Nick Saban and or going back to O'Brien to get him to agree to a contract. Well, so here's the only thing that may may have changed in my mind. When was that Saban-Belichick thing? Like, were the Patriots coming off a Super Bowl? Like, Bill feels a little more more desperate now. Maybe his view on that is has changed. But again, I, I'm not I'm not uh, trying to bark up the wrong tree. I just wonder if you're desperate. Maybe would you bend that rule? I don't think he was desperate. You know, indications I've gotten is that Belichick was somewhat encouraged by the way things were going toward the end of the year, and really Robert Kraft made sure that Bill O'Brien was going to be brought in. So, no, I don't agree that there was an agreement in place. And honestly, in my exchanges with people very, very close to the situation, O'Brien was very much in the dark as to what the Patriots' intentions were. And that was into the offseason. So I don't find it plausible. Uh, Tommy, we were just talking about some notes that came out from a former scout about how Bill how Bill Belichick used to evaluate quarterbacks back when he was with the Cleveland Browns. We're talking mid 90s and Mm -hmm. how much that may have evolved. He obviously has a pocket passer now who he drafted. Do you feel like he's evolved very much from the focus on accuracy and maybe not so much arm strength and not so much mobility and would you do you think he has a need to evolve, I guess, beyond some of the characteristics that your buddy Phil Perry calls the prototypical uh Patriot quarterback? Yeah, I think that was Daniel Jeremiah who yes, shared those. Exactly. And it was toughness was one of the number one things. Now, I think Mac Jones has shown physical toughness. I know that he twisted his ankle and his reaction was over the top. However, he has taken some really serious punishment over the course of time since he's been here, that reaction notwithstanding, and gotten up and continued to play. So to me, he has shown toughness. He has shown accuracy. I think Bill is now looking at an NFL, though, in which the ability to restart a play after it breaks down is much more prevalent than it was in 1995. So as Bill watches, for instance, Cam Newton in the mid-2010s shred his team, or Lamar Jackson now run wild against his team, or Pat Mahomes roll to the sideline with an arm flick, or Josh Allen. We can go on and on. That reality is present now in so many quarterbacks that I think there has to be an evolution. But we wouldn't know that unless Justin Fields and Mac Jones were both sitting on the board at 15, and they weren't. Wouldn't that have been fascinating to find out? Tommy, you just mentioned Lamar Jackson. Any value in kicking the tires on him for the Patriots? I don't think so because you're going to have a guy who's going to come in and command uh, or at least ask for a fully guaranteed contract that's going to be over $200 million just based on the 230 that Deshaun Watson, who's kind of a deviant, got. So if you're looking at what you're going to have to spend in draft capital for a team that still needs to build through the draft, what you're going to have to spend against your cap when you have a guy still who's $4 $4 million as opposed to $44 million. I just don't think it makes sense. And, he's, you know, the other thing with Lamar Jackson is he's played 12 games each of the past two years. And he's not, as time goes on, probably going to get more durable. So 
So to me, I, I understand, you know, why people are enamored with the idea of having him, but I, I, I wouldn't kick the tires on him if I were the Patriots. One more quickly here, Tom, before we let you go, and this is my mistake for not asking this earlier. We played a clip from you in your Patriots Talk podcast with Phil Perry yesterday where you gave it a, uh, well, not only a 5% chance that Brady could return this year, less than 5%, but also leaving the door open that he could return next year. Uh, what's your understanding on Brady and a potential return? It goes back to the idea of I'll quit when I suck. And did he suck this year? No. No. He led the league in yards. He led the league in attempts. He's still got plenty in the arm. And even at 46, will he be, or 47? I don't see it going away. Nor do I see his enjoyment of competition going away. I really believe, while there might be a lot of teams that go, not with a 47-year-old, no thank you. I think if Brady's life is in order in a way that he is comfortable with, and say, for instance, again, for the sake of argument, the Miami Dolphins don't pick up and extend to a tongue of Ilo and pick up his fifth year option. Well, then he's a free agent next year in Miami and Miami could be looking for a quarterback. And if Tom Brady has roots there, it would probably be an easier move for him after a year off than it might be now where it would look like the same Hamlet act of, Oh, do I want to quit? Do I not want to quit? Here I come. I come back. I think next year might have, I would put it higher than 5% likelihood that it would be more amenable to him then. Okay. Well, he's Tommy Curran. Yes. It does, like it does make sense. I like that you left the door open for this coming year. I like that the door is still a little open. Less than 4.99999, as I like to put it, is less than 5%. So I like that the door is open for this year. Very good. <laughs> Very good. All right. He's Tommy Curran. We'll talk to him uh, next week as we do each and every Thursday here on WEEI. Thanks, Tom.